we have our fabulous Miss Caitlin Beagle. I love Miss Caitlin. Come on stage. Miss Caitlin Beagle will be telling us a little bit more about Falcon governance as you, we all know you as the governance person in the Falcon Foundation. So looking forward to hear more. Thank you so much, Stefan. We're also joined by Michael Zargum, who's going to be co-presenting with me. And I feel very honored that he has agreed to do this because I think he has some really excellent ideas that helps explain why governance is not only so interesting, but also very, very complicated and something worth thinking about. So that's really sort of the scope of our presentation today is understanding what governance is and also trying to understand it even further as a constitutional system uh, and what that means for all of you, whether you're here just as curious parties, as token holders, as storage providers, developers, whatever it may be. Yeah? So, how do I move this? Great. All right. Um, so just brief introductions again, as Stefan mentioned, my name is Caitlin. I am the technical pro program manager for governance for the Filecoin ecosystem. I oversee the FIPS program and all of the other things that we use to try and make decisions about what is a priority for Filecoin's long-term development and sustainability. So this morning, I know Molly McInlay gave a presentation about the Filecoin roadmap, but before we get to a place where we say we have these enhancements and we have these new products being released, we have to first come together as an open community to decide what those things are going to be and what is it that matters most to all of us as a collective ecosystem. That is the job that governance tries to negotiate between, and it's what we're going to be talking a little bit more about today. We also have Michael, as mentioned. Um, Michael or Zargum, um, he works with us pretty frequently. He's the CEO of Block, Scientist, of Block Science um, and a digital civil engineer. He's involved in a lot of different projects, including the meta governance projects, and really excels at finding ways to incorporate traditional engineering, technical approaches to governance, and the meta governance layer, thinking about the theories and systems that allow us to come and create these very complex socio-technical spaces. Cool, thanks. You oh, hello. I'm, most people call me Z, so if you see me around, that's what you should call me. I'm going to let Caitlin continue since I know this is a pretty tight window. I'll give some slides in the middle. Yeah. yeah, so as mentioned, we're here today to talk about governance, but to make sure we're all on the same page, we want to first note that governance is really just a complex system of decision making for our community types. So as mentioned, we know that in Filecoin, we bring together a lot of different stakeholders with a lot of different interests and points of departure within the ecosystem. And it is our responsibility to think about the ways that they all come together, they negotiate their preferences and priorities for new tools, dApps, protocol changes, or even community standards, and find a ways to get people to a point of consensus that we can progress as a group. For us, this means thinking about what it means to do that legitimately. How do we reach consensus in a way that is sustainable and works for the majority of people? Is the majority a relatively useful mechanism for thinking about this? And how is it that we're able to design new systems and new tools for reaching this consensus in a way that continues to maintain what people expect from open and community spaces? Okay. You ready? Yeah. All right. So, um I want to talk a little bit about what we mean when we say political legitimacy. And I think the most important part about this concept is that it does not actually have a like final and ultimate definition. We need to think about it from a variety of different perspectives, and we need to think about it in a variety of different ways. So for starters, there's the notion that the process itself is legitimate, or that the, um, the you might say that the procedure, the term is usually procedural legitimacy, um, that basically the process we used to come to a decision was considered fair. That actually doesn't say anything about whether or not we made good decisions or whether after the fact we look at the outcomes that were derived from those processes and they were the things that were intended by the people who participated in that process. So we have actually a very different notion that relates to the outcomes. And since we can't actually get both at the same time, we can talk about legitimacy both from the perspective of the sort of substance of the decisions that arose from the process as well as the, the nature of the process that came to the decision. And then furthermore, we actually have to look at from which perspectives these things are deemed legitimate. So as a stakeholder, for starters, there are many different stakeholders. You could be the stakeholders who are responsible for um, implementing a policy decision. You could be the stakeholders who are directly affected by it. You might actually affect multiple different stakeholder groups that have different opinions about um, the effects or what would be a desirable outcome. And so 
we have to actually ask ourselves um, whether something is seen as legitimate from one or more perspectives, often including the perspective of external actors who have the ability to influence the system. So sometimes we might think about legitimacy in terms of how um, some sort of perceived external body sees the legitimacy of our system. And so just accepting for a moment that we can't just optimize for legitimacy, but rather we have to discuss it and engage in questions of, you know, in from which perspective is this being deemed legitimate? Does that make sense? Um, some of the effort to deal with this like deep trade-off space can be um, traced back to this idea of constitutionality. Um, part of the reason why um, I like constitutionality as a concept is that it leaves room for us to come to and decide upon processes and to deem those processes as legitimate and use them, but then to ultimately revise them later if and when they cease to, feel, to produce um, essentially substantively legitimate decisions. So like it could work for now. And I think remembering that it can work for now is an important um, way to approach these problems. And this particular table is meant to show two sort of platonic ideals. A, a perfectly immutable system might be great, but it's eventually gonna fall out of use as it doesn't necessarily meet your needs anymore. And a totally immutable system is subject to capture, can easily be attacked or used to serve the ends of a particular group. Something in between, so really the whole spectrum in between could be thought of as a kind of constitutional system where it's somewhat mutable, or it's mutable in a constrained way. This gives you the capacity to adapt, but also a degree of certainty, predictability, or procedural legitimacy in the near term. Um, we've actually been doing a lot of research um, on constitutional forms that are emerging in Web3 and beyond in, in other areas of open source. Um, as part of the Meta Governance Project. So for people who are interested in the sort of emergent constitutionality, both explicitly and implicitly, I recommend checking out this um, project called GovBase. This is an example screenshot from the Airtable, um, which contains the, uh, specifically the table related to um, constitutional structures. And it's tagged up and it's an ongoing project. You could think of it as a, um, an open source database. Uh, the Airtable allows people to potentially submit or propose uh, new records. Um, in the context of uh, constitutionalizing Filecoin governance, I'm going to argue that it's actually um, in a, a lineage of largely constitutional processes. So the open source communities, writ large, you know, Linux Foundation and others, sort of began developing processes for collectively governing code. And um, if you look at the markdown files uh, for the FIT process, you'll find references to these three other um, improvement uh, proposal processes. The EIP process, the BIP process, and the PEP process. Um, personally, I'm like a data scientist. I've been using Python for a couple decades, and um, the PEP process is pretty close to my heart. It's the Python enhancement uh, proposal process, I guess, depending on whether, whatever. Um, I, it's always easy to lose track of whether the P is supposed to be proposal or uh, process. But ultimately, this is a process that governs the enhancements to the Python language, and it was borrowed almost exactly for the Bitcoin improvement process. And while most people don't really realize it, Bitcoin is also an adaptive system. It uses this process to um, propose and in some cases make code changes that are then adopted by the, the miners actually running the network. Um, and then Ethereum's process was a pretty major fork of the BIT, pro BIT, BIT process, but it shares a lot of the same um, overall patterns, which are, again, largely inherited from the open source community. Um, the reason I'm emphasizing this, though, is that a process that's used to govern the process by which we change a code base that we all share is already quite constitutional. And so um, it's, it's a technical or it's a, a constitutional code way of thinking, because in this case, it's the code that everyone has to um, share. Next slide. Um, and what's important about this when we're thinking about it in governance terms is that the code is actually fulfilling the role of policy. It's, um, I tend to use the language algorithms as policy, um, where code might be the broader concept and you know, an algorithm is a specific instance of a rule, a process, a procedure. You give it an input, it generates an output. But when you select one of those, you are, quote unquote, structuring the possible field of action. You are affecting what other people are allowed to do, what happens when they do it. And so um, kind of borrowing from Lessig's Code 2.0 and a particular direct quote from an article about it, 
um, we might say that code regulates, but people write code. So when we're talking about these processes, like the fifth process, we're actually talking about the process through which people are regulating the process through which people are writing code. But if that's also regulating people's behavior, we have a sort of multi-layer um, regulatory process. So the next slide. So if we want to articulate this as a sort of, quote, system, you might say that we've got one set of you know, norms, practices, and procedures um, in and around the uh, FIT process that allows us to govern the process of writing and changing and adapting the code. So the upper bar on this diagram is basically that effectively social, institutional, procedural, how we decide um, what code changes to make versus the code itself as a, a, regula a regulatory body over the activities within the network, within our you know, open source infrastructure. And I don't want to dive all the way deeply into this, but it's essentially two copies of the same uh, problem stacked. One of them is people governing a set of processes that govern people, and then people <laughs> governing, in this case, the code processes that govern people. And so by stacking it, we can see it's actually two copies of a constitutional process. Um, and then we can sort of use that as a launching point for understanding how we might actually invest some energy in the upper portion. Because to be totally honest with you, I think that the, the lower portion works pretty well. Um, I think yeah. we've seen it emerge from a variety of different open source code um, governance contexts, and now we need to govern up one level. And I think with yeah. that, you should. Yeah, seeing a stack like this is a great reminder that governance is the place at which social requirements, cultures, the way we work together and form a community, meets all of the engineering work we do to actually build the Filecoin protocol, right? And to Michael's point, down on the bottom, we are really good at writing software, okay? We can create really complex proposals and we can ship them very quickly as well, okay? We know how to audit them, we know how to check them for feasibility, and we also are really good at implementing them. Where we need to improve is on this top social layer of creating better cultural practices around what it means to make decisions as a community about technical questions, what it means to be communicating openly about our technical preferences and the things that we need in order to get our work done, and what it is that we want, why it is that we participate in this ecosystem at all, right? Working collaboratively and making sure we have the same expectations for how this process is supposed to work, okay? And what we talk about when we talk about constitutionality are the rules and procedures that are clearly explained, understood and accessible to everyone, so that we can create this standardization across a wide array of stakeholders who, again, have different points of entrance into this ecosystem, have different wants and needs within it as well. Okay. So again, Filecoin is already structured to be a constitutional system, and this is to our great benefit. Okay? We have this lineage of other proposal processes, the PEP process, the Bitcoin improve improvement proposals, the Ethereum improvement proposals that came before us, and we have this great opportunity to take the structures that are currently in place and make them as innovative and creative as possible within a structure that is clearly bound and allows us to explore new and exciting technical proposals that is a, in a rule-based way, okay? So our task going forward then is to strategize, socialize, and scale the work we're doing so that we can continue to improve governance to make it lightweight and receptive to our needs, while also, again, being rule-based and ensuring that this ecosystem is able to socially decentralize over time. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? You guys got it? We got, it. got it. We love it. All right. Well, thank Did we do okay on time? I don't know. Did we, we're good on time, Stefan? We, wow. All right, that's wonderful. That's a record, yeah. I think. We worked really hard to get this down to fit. <laughs> yeah, we started with like 80 slides. You guys caught a break. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks.